Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Mei Taisho, Bizarre Incidents from Japan's Past, is now out. If hearing about some of the weird, bizarre, strange, and downright frightening events from the last 100 or so years of Japanese history interests you, then do head over and check it out right now. We also have a brand new design up in the Koobana merchandise store. You can check that out at koobana.store. We have shirts, mugs, stickers, masks, and much more, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we have a few short stories for you before diving into the penultimate episode of the Friend in the Tape series. We're almost at the end. But first, let's take a trip to a rather terrifying hospital ward and the spirits that lurk there. This one's called Ward Nurse. I'm a ward nurse, but I don't really have much sense when it comes to the supernatural. Still, there are some days where I feel like I can see something out the corner of my eye, and some days just feel unbearably frightening for some reason. At the previous hospital I worked at, there were two rows of rooms in a U-shape, with a window at the end, and sometimes, while doing my rounds, I would feel a chill behind me. If I looked in the reflection of the window, then sometimes I saw something looking back at me. One day, a patient went home for the night before their official discharge from hospital for some rehabilitation, but after that, they went missing. The hospital filed a missing persons report and staff helped the family look for them, so I was assigned to the night shift to cover the lack of staff. Everything was terribly busy because of the sudden change, so I regretted taking the shift. After three, the family of the missing patient came in, and while my partner dealt with them, I did my rounds to see those who needed treatment by myself. The missing patient was from a four-patient room, and although nobody there needed treatment, I still did my rounds and checked each person to make sure there were no changes. But when I reached the missing patient's bed, there appeared to be someone under the blankets. There was a dementia patient in the hospital at the time, so I thought maybe it was them. But the moment I touched the blankets, I heard the missing patient's voice. I'm so cold. My entire body seemed to freeze like ice as goosebumps spread from my fingertips all over my body. I returned to the nurse's office, unable to even scream, but I was so afraid that something might be behind me that I pressed my back to the wall and waited for my partner to arrive. It was then that I got a call from our supervisor. It seemed the missing patient had been found in the ocean. After that, that patient sometimes appeared behind me while I was working the night shift. Whenever they were around, it was freezing. Even in the middle of summer, I had to wear a cardigan, and I was unable to focus because of it. I wasn't confident that I could handle that ward properly anymore, so I asked to be transferred, but the patient continued to appear, so I had to quit. I no longer work at that hospital, and the patient never appeared to me again. But there were some days where I was so scared that when my partner took a break and left me alone, all I could do was press my back to the wall and wait for them to return. The student in this next story attends a university on top of a mountain, but being so far from civilization can be scary when you miss the final bus home for the night. Find out why in University on the Mountain. This is something that happened to me while I attended a university located on top of a mountain. I'm not sure if I can precisely remember every word and detail of how I felt at the time, so I'll try to keep it brief. This happened when I was in the third grade, and shortly after I started working in the research lab. It was around summer or autumn, 
and there was a delay in getting the data I needed for my biology graduation project. As such, I just missed the last bus home from the university. I was renting an apartment near the station closest to the university, and I used the bus to get there, so I had no choice but to walk down the dark road all by myself to get home. The road was paved, at least, but because it was up in the mountains, there were no other houses or even passers-by, and the only sound was that of my shoes hitting the road. I used the light from my phone to light the way, and then I heard a car driving in the same direction as me. I kept walking, paying little attention to it, and then the car stopped a short distance away after passing me. Immediately, I grew frightened. Maybe some weirdos were going to kidnap me, or some pseudo-yakuza were going to beat me up for my money. I stopped to run back, and as the car horn got more and more incessant, I ran even faster. As I ran, I saw a rather low fence near the road, so I quickly jumped it and ran through a field back towards the university. Before long, the parking lot came into view. I was thinking of running to a lab near the parking lot when I saw a male student standing nearby. I ran over to him and asked him for help, greatly surprising him, but I showed him my school ID and begged him to drive me down to the foot of the mountain. I cast aside any shame I might have had and pleaded with him to help me. He was from an entirely different department and I had no idea who he was, but after listening to my story, he agreed to help me. On the ride down, I finally managed to calm down a little. I was still scared of that car, so I climbed into the back seat and then laid down to hide. Do you see any strange cars parked on the side of the road? I asked. But he said there were no cars or even people. I was relieved when I could finally hear the sounds of traffic at the bottom of the mountain. The student dropped me off at my apartment, and then I went straight to bed. The next morning, I saw on the news that there had been an accident on that mountain road the night before. A man and a woman died in it. And now, we're almost at the end of my Friend in the Tape series. We're getting into the nitty-gritty of the effects T's visit to the cave had on him, followed by his yearly camping trip with friends. But this might prove to be their final trip together. Find out why in My Friend in the Tape 5. This is B, and this is the follow-up to My Friend in the Tape 4. I'm submitting what T wrote in the summer of 2012, before he collapsed, in his stead. The 2012 Obon Holidays after exploring the cave and after M crashed my car. It started on the afternoon of the third day after that. I dropped by M's pharmacy to tape up the bumper that was falling off and then returned to my parents' house. I was preparing my tools to fix it when C arrived. I tended to do the work myself, but it's easier when I have an assistant who I can just say stuff like drill, tie wrap, to as well. Twenty minutes passed and I started joking around with C, but then she suddenly confronted me as to why I was at M's place to begin with. I thought that mentioning the weakening of my guardian spirits would inevitably lead to talk of the cave, so I decided to step around the issue. Still, she refused to give up. Remembering the shrine, I succeeded in getting her in the car instead so we could go for a drive until it was time to go shopping. I also wanted to take the car for a test drive, so I got on the highway and briefly floored it. We arrived at the familiar shrine in only 10 minutes, when it would have taken 40 if we used the bypass. I think this is the first time I've brought you here, I said. I live nearby, so I often came here. This is the only place around here that never changes. You know, if you pray for something here, it will come true. I prayed for friends that would always be by my side, and then I met you guys. First I prayed, and then sat on a pine tree I always used to climb as a kid 
and looked around. The area was surrounded by apartments and the bypass was nearby, but the air in this area was clean and fresh. Everything was exactly the same as when I was a child. It was like nothing had changed at all. Why was there only one pine tree in the shrine grounds and why did it grow sideways? I always wondered that. Growing more and more nostalgic, I walked over to see who was still praying and stood beside her. As a child, I could only ring that bell by grabbing the rope with both hands, but now I could ring it with just one. It made me realize just how much I'd grown. I loved the sound of that bell and always used to ring it for like 10 minutes straight. Looking closer, I could see a repair mark on it now. I put all the cash I had on hand into the donation box, hoping that it would help the poor shrine that had few followers and maybe help protect me as well. Please remain just as you are now, I prayed. Although, if I remember correctly, that shrine was a cultural asset, so it wasn't like it would be going anywhere. And once I was done praying, my shoulders suddenly seemed much lighter. C said she wanted to see the house I was born in, but it had long since been rebuilt into an apartment that was being rented out. Still, she insisted. It was about a five minute walk from the shrine, and on the way, I bumped into a neighbor I hadn't seen in roughly 25 years. Oh my, you've grown up splendidly, she said, and seemed surprised at how little I'd changed since I was a child. We got back in the car and C drove us to the supermarket where we were planning to meet up with everyone. I fell asleep on the way and when I woke up, I was surrounded by everyone who was going camping with us. I got out of the car to go shopping, but everyone kept a slight distance from me. As I suddenly caught a glimpse of myself in the window, something seemed off about my face. Looking closer, there were eyes drawn on my eyelids, a fake beard, and swirls on my cheeks. Oh, come on, guys. This is oil-based, isn't it? And what's with this writing? The characters for inside and meat were scribbled on my forehead. Everyone burst into laughter. A woman holding a bag on the other side of the glass suddenly looked at me in surprise. A handed me a mask and sunglasses, and then we went inside to do our shopping. There it was. I looked just like a weird old guy trying to hide his face with strange words written on his head. As the others argued over what to buy, I'd removed the mask and sunglasses as people walked by and made my own fun. C caught me a few times and warned me. They'll call the police on you, you know. I went back to the car to get my stuff and asked someone if I could stay at their place for the night. I could hardly return to my parents' house looking the way I did. Both A and C said yes, so we had dinner at C's house and then I decided to stay at A's house for the night. Nice to see you again, sir, A and I said when we saw C's father and he quickly took note of my face. It's the latest fashion, I joked as I pushed past him. There was still a bit of time until dinner was ready, so I took a shower. I wondered why the shower room, which was separate to the bath, was separated by glass. Odd. The bottom part was frosted glass, so I was standing there, swinging my hips around like a stripper, when A suddenly came in. Well, that was certainly awkward. I'll pretend I didn't see that, he said. When I returned to the living room, C's father apologized to me. I asked him why, and apparently the writing on my face was C's idea. She just started drawing, and next thing she knew, everyone had gathered around. Be grateful she didn't colour in your front teeth, A said. When I told him I didn't care because I personally couldn't see it, they smiled bitterly in return. On the way to A's house after dinner, he reminisced. We also drew on your face during junior high, didn't we? 
Not long after we started junior high, I fell asleep at B's house, and then he, A, D, and E took my clothes off and drew hairs all over me. I was still a hairless kid who wished to be an adult at the time, so I added a happy trail myself and then posed for them all. But then B's mother came in with some tea and saw me. When A's parents saw my face, we told them they were just imagining things, and then we went to bed. The fourth day of the Obon holidays. Finally, it was time for our once a year camping trip, the thing I always looked forward to the most. We went in two separate cars, A's and D's. F and D wanted to be alone in D's car, so the rest of us went in A's. B sat in the passenger seat while C sat in the right rear seat and I in the left. You've been sleeping quite a bit lately. Are you feeling unwell? A suddenly asked me on the drive over. Ever since high school, you've made it a habit to never sleep more than three hours a night, right? But this morning I could barely get you up at all. Yeah, I've been worried too, C chimed in. M Chan said you were too tired and to let you sleep, but you slept for more than an hour in the car yesterday. Normally, if I make a wrong turn on the way somewhere, you'll wake up and say something like, turn right at the next light. Hearing that, it suddenly hit me. Ever since I started my job, I made it a habit to only sleep three hours a night and then 15 minutes during lunch. The rest of my time, I used to study and work on myself. I'd been living like this for 15 years, so I was quite used to it. But ever since I destroyed the sarcophagus, I slept four hours at the cave, three that night, then four hours at M's house, one hour in C's car, and six hours at A's house, for a total of 18 hours sleep in 42 hours. I don't know. Ever since yesterday, I just fall asleep once I let go, I said, and then soon fell asleep again. Was this in reaction to the loss of support from my guardian spirits? We arrived at the parking area near the campgrounds and got our stuff out of the car. There would be nowhere for us to get food nearby, so we had a lot of food and drinks with us. Normally, I would carry the heaviest stuff and joke about the others getting me a drink in return, but this time around, I wasn't strong enough to do it. Usually I could lift up to twice my body weight without any sort of prep. I tried to stand with a load on my shoulder, but there was no strength in my legs. Seems he's not feeling too well today, A said to D, who looked confused. A, B, and then D took turns carrying the heavy stuff instead. I grabbed my stuff and two tents, and then we made our way towards the campgrounds. After a two-hour walk through the mountains, we reached the campsite. We quickly found a spot to pitch our tents and put three up, then asked D and F to find some firewood while we dug a bath. C wasn't strong enough to help us dig, so we asked her to tie some picnic cheeks together to make an enclosure instead. Because the hot spring source was around 52 degrees, we dug two baths, one warm and one hot, and then two small baths in which we could fully lie down. Then, as I was about to chop the firewood they had brought, F approached me. Hey, you don't look so good, she said. She was D and E's classmate, and after high school, she moved to another prefecture with her family and became a nurse before coming back. D, E, and F all transferred to my school during junior high, which was how I knew them. D and F started dating in high school, but after F moved, he never dated anyone else. Come on, come this way, she said, and pushed me into a tent. She seemed to be checking my pulse on my wrist. Then she made me take my shirt off, and she put an ear to my chest to listen for my heartbeat. Yeah, I said when she saw my chest, but she just got angry at me. Hey, are you okay? She said a few minutes later. I don't have to be a doctor to know this isn't normal. I can't feel a pulse, nor hear your heartbeat. 
How on earth are you moving? Just tell everyone it's anemia, I said. I'll be fine after I sleep for a bit. Please. When I woke up, C was looking down at me with concern on her face. Seemed dinner was ready and she came to get me. I thanked her and got dressed. What's going on with you? She asked. It's just anemia, I said. There's no way anemia could cause this. Cause what? I asked, and she pointed to the scars all over my body. I looked down to see what she was pointing at. There was the scar I got when I was stabbed with a butterfly knife when I was a rebellious kid out looking for fights, and a cut on my shoulder from when I was stabbed with a broken bottle, both clearly visible in the dim light of the single lantern in the tent. I never paid much attention to them before because both healed cleanly within three days after applying a bandage. C and I were such good friends that we could take baths together, so I knew it would be impossible to hide anything from her. I'll tell you later, I said. For now, let's just enjoy our trip. Then I left the tent. Dinner was gyoza, F's specialty. There was shiso, cheese, and crunchy plum, all nostalgic flavours for me. After dinner, we gathered around the fire while A played guitar. This was also a tradition for us. He could play anything like a jukebox, other than recent J-pop, but if he listened to a song just twice, then he could play it. I requested Teaching Myself to Dream and Moonlight Shadow, and asked C to sing. Do that thing from the live, B then said to me. That thing happened during our second grade of high school. Some of my friends from school and some of our friends from C school formed a band, and to cover for something that happened during our live performance, I did a little ad-libbing. Sure, C said. I was a little embarrassed, so I refused, and then A, B, and C explained to F what happened. E was there at the time too. C was on vocals and I played drums alongside two others. We took part in a small live performance at a music store where four groups played five songs each. We were set to play fourth. Everything went fine up until the fourth song, but then, once the fifth song started, nobody sung. We played the prelude over and over, as though waiting for someone to sing. At the end of the second time around, The guests and other band members noticed something was wrong, and people started to mutter. This must be the last song, right? I looked at C, who seemed to be panicking, and realised she must have forgotten the lyrics. So, I decided to ad-lib. I stopped playing and approached her, singing A Whole New World from Aladdin. During the Or Say We're Only Dreaming part, I kissed the back of C's hand and pretended we were singing a duet. If C didn't join in with some perfectly timed lyrics, then it would have been a cold, cold world. Everyone in the audience clapped, but I saw the woman running the event was crying. I went to apologise for singing a ballad at a rock event, but unexpectedly, she praised us. Most of the women in the audience were crying, weren't they? B said. We visited the video store next door after, and all the copies of Aladdin were gone, (laughs) A said. My head just went blank and I was like, well, this is it, C said with a laugh. That's just like you, D said. Why did you sing Aladdin though, F asked, and in English even. I mean, I thought it was a bit on the nose, but... It was the only song I could think of at the time to buy time for the male part, and I figured C would be able to go along with it as well, I replied. Why didn't you just sing a song by yourself? She asked again. She was in such a state of shock that her eyes were unfocused, so I figured it would traumatise her if I just left her there like that, and so I made her sing as well. Huh. So you were thinking about her as well. 
as F asked me all sorts of questions. She was acting like a big sister, which is a little scary. C suddenly stood up and started singing, Tale as old as time. <gasps> Beauty and the Beast. I suddenly joined her for just a little change. And just like that, I got out of F's grilling. Let's fade out into the baths after this song, she whispered. And then we escaped. After having my back washed, I soaked in the water and stared at the starry sky above. Suddenly I remembered that we hadn't divided the tents yet. Would it be D and F, B and C, and then A and me? Or C and F, A and D, and B and me? I wasn't sure what to expect. I found A, B, D and F drinking around the fire. That's your tent, B said, and I went inside to find C lying down. Ah, my bad, wrong tent. I said, and went back out. Which tent is mine again? I asked, and they pointed to the same tent once more. Well, I didn't mind sleeping with C, so I went back in again and laid down. Fifth day of the Obon holidays. I woke up first, so I made breakfast for everyone and sandwiches for lunch. Everyone planned on going for a walk around the area, but I intended to go back to bed. If I passed out while everyone was walking, then I'd just cause more trouble for them. I keenly felt what M said about me working at less than normal capacity now. As I was making a shade cloth for the bath, C came to tell me that everyone was awake. I went back and we all ate together. As we were eating, I told everyone that I would stay behind, so C said she would remain as well. Something bad might happen if you're alone, so we should avoid doing anything by ourselves, F said. And so, the decision was made. C and I saw the other four off, and while she washed the plates, I took a bath. I put my arms and legs out and soaked just my torso in the hot water. In this position, I could lay in the water for hours and not have all the blood rush to my head. Drinking some barley tea, I also had my first cigarette in a while. I tried not to smoke in front of non-smokers, other than C, so it was my first one since the cave. D and I, as well as E, were the only ones of us childhood friends who smoked. Suddenly writing about what happened during the Obon holidays felt like I was writing a diary. The laptop I carried around in private didn't have any power. Oh well, and I'd be lying if I said that writing short, easy to understand sentences was easy for me, someone who was a science major. If it were a thesis or report, then I could write it like I was doing my job. Let's just write down my experiences and thoughts. Thinking that everything I wrote was crap, C suddenly arrived as I was putting down what I thought was the best part. She brought a fan and some barley tea, then sat next to me and wiped the sweat from my forehead as she fanned me. She was great at cooking and incredibly thoughtful. She would make a great wife, I thought, and I wondered if she had any suitors. She was both beautiful and stylish. Wait, if she got married to someone we didn't know, then I'd no longer be able to hang out with her like now. Maybe B really was the right guy for her then. You said yesterday that we'd talk later, right? She said interrupting my thoughts. So, she remembered. Well, it was only the day before, I guess. Time to just spit it out, right? I thought about what I should tell her and what I should keep to myself. Let me start by saying that I can't see them, so I don't know whether this is actually true or not, I said. I then told her about what M said the day before last regarding my guardian spirit's weakening and how she warned me to take care of my health. In truth, I felt great, but I couldn't seem to stay awake for very long, and I couldn't focus on releasing the energy in my lower abdomen. If you do martial arts, then you'll probably understand what I mean. I should add that once the holidays ended, I planned on having a full body checkup at the doctor. 
Horseflies soon started to bother me, so I got out of the bath and had an early lunch. I wanted to go back to the tent and use C's legs as a pillow, but she was wearing jeans. Mmm, no thanks, I said, and as I went to blow up a cushion, she changed into hot pants. The height of her legs was just perfect for a pillow. How did you know? I said. We've been friends forever, she replied. I tend to know what you're thinking at all times. We really did have the worst relationship. It's been a long time since I fell asleep like this, I thought, and closed my eyes. Sing something for me, I said. (laughs) You think you're a king or something, she replied. You're so nice, I said, and thoughtful. Back when we were in elementary school, you were bigger than me and rougher than all us dudes. She punched me. But you really have changed. Almost like you changed genders. I've always been a girl, she said, and punched me again. Do you want to take this outside? You're the one who hit me first, I said with a laugh. I got to thinking while I was in the bath. We're old enough now to be getting married and having kids. How much longer are we all going to be able to gather like this? S got married and moved far away, right? And now she has three kids. K left home to go to a university and then got married to a beautiful woman. I also left home for university and then got a job. The number of classmates I'm still close with is getting less and less. Even A, B, D and E... We were all the same age, but next thing I knew, we were starting to drift apart and do our own things. You've always been there for me, and when I think about how you might not always be there, it makes me sad. Wait, who's going to disappear? C said. You're the one who left first. We were all studying hard for exams, and you were like, I have a recommendation to university, and a scholarship too. I don't have to pay any fees either. Try to think about how we were feeling. I mean, you did try teaching us, but I couldn't understand what you were saying as I ate rice crackers. Ah, when I used the bonnet of E's car as a whiteboard. Well, thanks to that, everyone got into the university of their choice, didn't they? You were a D student before that, weren't you? During November of our final year, I was like, what the hell? When you said our next lecture was going to be on meditation. (laughs) Well, it's important. You need to visualize how you're going to achieve success and visualize yourself performing to the best of your abilities. You were able to solve problems you couldn't do before that way, weren't you? You can get there yourself without having to memorize formulas and such once you know how it all works. But... For the past few days, I haven't been able to visualize myself as a high performer. Before, I could see sparks flying when I meditated, and then I'd get results I was happy with. But now, it's like my head is blank and my body won't move. So my thoughts got a little negative and I got sad thinking that one day you'll get married and move away. And who exactly am I going to marry? I don't think that's possible for me. I wouldn't say that. Around the second grade of high school or so. Honestly, I don't want to admit it, but you started to look real cute then. And now that you've gotten older, you're more beautiful. You're a hard worker, good at housework, you're kind and thoughtful, bright and fun. You're good at singing and the piano as well. You tick all the boxes. You should have more confidence in yourself. You can get married whenever you want. You have my seal of approval, so be grateful. My eyes were closed, but I could feel tears falling on my face. Is there someone you like? I asked. There is. Do you think it will go well? No matter what I do, he never looks at me that way, so I thought I'd give up, but maybe... I'll try a little harder now. I felt bad for her. There were no other women in the world quite like her. You can do it. Just like Anzai Sensei says, if you give up, then it's over right then and there. 
How long have your feelings been one-sided? Since third grade. Wow, that was a long time. I felt a little bad for the other person too. It was almost like a curse. And are they with us on this camp? Yes. <gasps> All right. I wouldn't lose any friends this way. What started it all, or rather, is there a reason why you've never said anything all this time? He always helps me out. Always. When I couldn't talk to anyone and felt like everything was falling apart, suddenly he called me. He never called me out of the blue, and when I asked why he called, he said, just because. And when I'm in trouble, he shows up out of nowhere and helps me. What a nice guy. Was it A, maybe? Is that what you were praying so hard for at the shrine? Yes. Then it'll come true. I guarantee it. And if it doesn't happen by the time you turn 35, then I'll marry you. All right, that's a promise. We silently pinky sweared, and then I fell asleep. I woke up to a lot of noise outside. C apparently kept fanning me and wiping my sweat as I slept, because I felt quite comfortable. I thanked her for letting me use her legs as a pillow, and then went outside. I asked what was going on, and they showed me a pheasant they caught. That's a male, I said. It's still alive, so what are you going to do with it? It was forbidden to hunt females. You deal with it, B said. Hey, we already have enough food, don't we? I mean, I'd like to try it, but I don't want to kill it needlessly. You were asleep in the car, so I guess you don't know, huh? B said. We absolutely do not have enough food. There's nothing left in C's cooler, right? You used all the corned beef for sandwiches, so we only have a few vegetables and some rice left. All right, all right, I get it. But why me? Because you were sleeping with C. And well, we can't exactly kill it. C and I said nothing. Well, what else could I do? I told C to stay with everyone else. How was I supposed to do this? What was the order? There were four key points, right? Hang it upside down and hold the wings so they couldn't move. If I didn't pluck the feathers before death, then they would be harder to remove. If I didn't remove the insides right away, then the meat would smell. And its insides were basically the same as a human's, right? Something like that. I grabbed some plastic string, a bucket, newspaper, knife, wire, and a table, and took them to the water's edge. I tied the legs and hung it from the table. The wings were held in place by wrapping newspaper around it like a cone. As it looked at me, it reminded me of the parakeet I used to keep as a pet, and I felt bad. I tried to remember the anatomy charts we used to have when I was a child. There was no way it could be that different to a person, right? I'm so sorry. I apologized in my heart. I won't let you go to waste. I put my hands together in prayer and then covered the bird's eyes with my left hand. It began to thrash as I cut it. I suddenly remembered that humans could live for up to three minutes after having their carotid artery cut, so I apologized again and quickly finished the job. I removed the insides and called A, B, and D once I cleaned up to help remove the feathers. It occasionally twitched, scaring A and D. We cleaned everything up and it started to get dark, so we returned to camp. Show some gratitude, I said, and A, C, and F quietly put their hands together in prayer. D was off using the toilet. Hey, great job, B said. I was just about to put the knife down, but suddenly I clenched it again. Now's not the time for that, F said and gave B a kick. As expected of our big sister, she understood. B fell backwards in surprise. 
You can go without until you finally understand, she said, and then returned to cooking. I went past her with the knife in hand and went to the river to wash it. When I came back, I used a stone rather than a sponge to try to get rid of the remaining blood and feeling in my hands when C approached me. She saw blood coming from my hands and embraced me. She felt warm and the strange, unpleasant feeling in my hands disappeared. I watched the wounds on my hands heal in a matter of seconds like watching a tape play in reverse. Hey, you can heal with your hands too. I said to C as I washed away the remaining blood. Why are you here? I asked her. F said that your eyes had been glazed over since dealing with the bird, so I should follow you. Again, as expected of our big sister. When we returned, B was sitting in front of the pot and D was walking around him, chanting something silly and smacking him on the back. It was so stupid that I burst out laughing. Everyone poked at the pheasant as we tried it for the first time, and we all agreed. F's cooking was the best. If I had to compare it to something, it was even better than most mother's homemade meals. C was a great cook as well, but this was another level. As I sat down to have a cigarette after dinner, D approached me. You hate killing the most of all, and yet you did it. Well done, he said. When we returned to the campfire, we talked about our winter plans. I said I wanted to go skiing at a hot spring. Aren't you a snowboarder? B asked. I started skiing first. Now I mostly do that and snowboard occasionally. Is there anyone else who can ski other than B? Yeah, you said you used to ski even before you met me. If you teach me how to do it, I'll go too. C said. All right, what about skis? If you want my old ones, I can give you a set with boots and such as well. Sweet, but aren't they expensive? Well, they don't have cute designs on them. Ah, well, you'll have to try the boots on, so you'll have to come over at least once beforehand. I'll come over after work sometime. Can I spend the night? Of course. You can use the bed. It's a double, so we can share. I'll give you a key tomorrow, so come over whenever you want. It's a three-bedroom apartment, but I use them as a hobby, work, and drying rooms. So the bedroom is basically the living room. It might be a little weird, I said. A work room? Everyone said at once. Yeah, I don't have a garage, so... I used it to take engines apart and make pieces by myself. You prioritize your hobbies so much that you have nowhere to sleep. That's so like you, Dee said. Just like a happy, rich, single person, F said. No, it's not like that, I said. I get lonely. After living alone for more than 10 years, well, it's hard to go home unless you're surrounded by the things you like. Even now, I often work late because I don't want to go home to an empty house. It's not like I can head out to work from a friend's house at this age. Why don't you look for a girlfriend? B asked. The air suddenly grew tense. I had one before, I said. But she wouldn't treat me as an equal like C. I only seem to date people who treat me like I'm better than them. So we soon break up. I'd rather spend all my time with you guys. I kind of wish time would stop, just like this. I suddenly realized that what I said was awfully embarrassing and excused myself to go to the toilet. Someone was calling me. It was C's voice. Was she crying? I had to go help her. When I opened my eyes, C was holding me. I had no idea what was going on. I pushed her off me and looked around. A, B, D and F were also crying. I was in front of the baths. My chest hurt. I was beginning to understand what was going on. I collapsed on the way to the baths and F was giving me CPR. 
I thanked her and tried to stand up when A hit me. Don't scare us like that. A had never hit me before, so I was shocked. It wasn't time that stopped, but your heart. B then screamed and hit me too. What happened? I asked. A and B saw me pass out on the way to the baths. They screamed and ran over to me. They turned me over and checked my airways until F arrived, but I wasn't breathing. She then started CPR and C kept calling my name the whole time. I apologised for the trouble and worry I caused, and promised I'd have a thorough checkup once we got back. A and D then helped me back to my tent. I noticed B's precious video camera lying on the ground by the fire as we passed, and I felt even worse. It seemed things were worse than I thought. I could only stay awake for a short period of time, and perhaps because of stress or injury, I hadn't just passed out, but my heart actually stopped. I had to be very, very careful. The sixth day of the Obon holidays. I woke up and found myself sleeping with C, so I woke her up and we went to take a bath. Someone had opened the sleeping bag before I went to bed and spread it out like a mattress with a blanket. I felt better after getting some sleep. Well, I just didn't realise I wasn't feeling all that well to begin with. Long baths drain you of energy, so we quickly got out once we were done washing each other's backs. As I was getting ready to pack up, B woke up much earlier than usual and told me to sit down. He'd do it for me. How thoughtful of him. People jokingly said that his face was a weapon because of how scary he looked when someone broke up with him, and he actually was a great fighter as well. But deep down, he was a gentle nerd who was a big softy when it came to women. One time, during the summer holidays, he invited me over to his house to watch some dirty videos. C came over, and when he asked her if she wanted to join in, she deleted the data and threw the laptop out the window. She then strangled him and screamed, Don't you show this filthy stuff to T-chan? Everyone woke up and insisted I sit while they packed up. Thanks, guys. Because I had some time, I wrote down everything that happened the day before. But as I wrote, I realised something. My body was in pretty bad shape. Also, it wasn't that rare for C and I to take a bath together, but then it hit me. Was it really that normal, even for childhood friends of the opposite sex, to still take a bath together when they were adults? I'd been returning home more and more over the last year or so, and... Even during those times, we bathed together, and even slept together in the nude. Well, C kept her underwear on. I'd never seen nor heard about her doing that with any of our other childhood friends. Well, we did grow up next door to each other and saw each other every day, so it was like we were family. Still, it wasn't really appropriate behaviour for someone who was going to get married in the future, so... It was about time to stop, huh? Everyone took turns carrying my stuff as we went back down the mountain. I'm sorry for all of this, I said. Friends exist to cause trouble, B replied, so don't worry about it. It was apparently something E, the troublemaker of our group, used to say. I slept again in the car on the way home, and in a daze, I left my laptop in A's car. I'll copy what's in my notebook onto my PC instead. C said she wanted to spend the night at my place, so we got out together. I gave her the duplicate key for my apartment that my parents had, and once I was done organising transportation of my car and plane tickets, I laid on a cushion in the living room and fell asleep. When I woke up, my mother was home and making dinner in the kitchen with C. C had learnt to cook from my mother a long time ago, so it was a familiar sight. F sometimes came too. The root vegetables for the soup were frozen overnight so they'd be sweeter, and the meals my mother made were so good, they were like that of a proper restaurant. 
So much so that when I had something else, it tasted terrible, like an instant meal. My mother always prepared three side dishes for breakfast and five for dinner. She was very good at what she did. The dishes were laid out naturally, like parent and child. It seemed the laundry that had built up during the holidays was also done and out to dry. I prepared a bed for C in the guest room and then returned to the living room. My father and older brother were there, and the scene was somewhat familiar. But it was like I was the outsider here. After dinner, C did the dishes, and I told my parents that I gave her the duplicate key for my apartment. I returned to my room and saw that not only had she cleaned my bed and vacuumed the floor, but that the dust on all the bookshelves had been wiped off as well. She was, quite simply, too fast. A pro. If only A or B would quickly snatch her up, that would be one less worry on my mind. The seventh day of the Obon holidays. When I woke up, all my stuff was packed and ready to go. It seemed C got up early and even ironed my clothes. I got the used masks out of my car and put them into the transport car. On the way to the airport, I handed them and the sealed case to a former classmate who was a researcher at university. I asked him to examine the masks and case to see if there was any strange bacteria or something attached. He wasn't exactly a blabbermouth, but I asked him to keep quiet about it because it could be dangerous, then slipped him 300,000 yen. Since I was seated opposite the cabin attendant on the flight, I decided to ask them some questions about the plane. One of them handed me a card with a phone number on it, remarking on how I seemed to like planes so much, but I was just trying to kill time and there was no way I could bother them in their private time. Once I got home, I charged the batteries on my bikes, called C and my parents, and then went straight to bed. End of August. I stayed overnight at the hospital for a full checkup. End of September. The results from the hospital were great. They said that counselling could help with the long hours of sleep, but because I destroyed the sarcophagus without contacting the research institute, as I should have, I couldn't say anything about the cave. And supposing that E's death had something to do with how I felt, then the symptoms should have shown up much sooner. If there was anything new on that mask I asked my classmate to check, then I hoped they would figure it out soon. I sent an email to C and B, showing them the test results were good. I didn't want to worry C, who was usually so innocent and yet steadfast, like a sunflower. She was the type who dwelled on things, so I hoped that she had somebody nearby who would look after her. I felt like A or B said they'd look after her at the camp, so I was probably worrying over nothing. Start of October. I got a call from the friend I asked to look at the mask and case. After doing a culture test, all he found was regular airborne bacteria. There was no dust or anything else noteworthy. The truth behind the red haze E saw, as well as the voices, remained unknown. But there was still so much we didn't know about this whole case, like the disappearing fragments of the sarcophagus. As soon as I feel better, I'll go back to that cave again with some guys in the archaeology course. I still know where it is, and if it poses a threat or something happens to me, I'll delete all data except for the diary that doesn't specify its location so that no one can visit it. C called and said she'll be here around the middle of October. I'll have to get things ready. I don't care if this doesn't connect well with the previous posts. I can't rest, so I'm just going to put it all down without any editing. And that was the end of what T wrote. Two days later, he passed out and was taken to the hospital. A massive thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina and S Dash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much.
Don't forget to check out Mei Taisho, Bizarre Incidents from Japan's Past, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koobana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koobana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koobana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kawabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kawabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koobana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koobana.net now.